part two, what I'm going to talk about tonight, and probably worth looking at this for a minute. It's called Escaping the Grip of Relationship Ticks. And that comes from a saying that Jack Frost gave us when he came here. And he said that codependence is like two ticks and no dog. So a codependent relationship is like two people locking in. And instead of being life-giving to each other, they're life-draining. And that is not, that's not flourishing in the Lord. How many want to flourish in the Lord? Well, then, then part of tonight's goal would be to look at, are there relationships in my life that are life-draining, that are not, they're not filling me with, with more of the character and the nature of God, but needy people are draining me. And there's nothing wrong with needy people. We've been doing deliverance in this church since we started on the first day. So we're open to people getting help. We want to be that, that place. But sometimes you can go too far, and, and that soul tie can become a codependency, and that's really unhealthy. And that's what ticks do, right? Ticks suck the blood out of you. So we don't want those kind of relationships. And the way this artist drew this picture, it happens to be a woman on the left and a man on the right, but it could be either way. Uh, believe me when I tell you, it's not restricted to, to the gender. But you can see how her strategy is very tight in her mind, but his strategy is falling apart, and she's reaching her hand in there and replacing what he had with her thoughts, and that's witchcraft, all right? Codependence and ticks is draining you. You don't want that. doesn't mean you don't love people, but you have to recognize if there's an ungodly soul tie that's hooking you into that person. I'm going to go into more scriptures tonight that aren't just around sexual soul ties, and, and it's a really deep process because guess what? We have a blind spot. If you knew it was codependent, if you knew it was unhealthy and, and life was being sucked away, then you would do something about it. But the, the witchcraft part of this is that it hides and it taps into a weakness in your heart. You become vulnerable because there's an area in your heart that you don't recognize has a low immune system, spiritual immune system. And one of the ways the Sanfords describe it could be if you were raised in a home with alcoholic one or both of your parents being alcoholic, right? That would be a very chaotic scene for a child who really needs stability growing up. So, wow, you know, in your formative years, you're seeing so much inconsistency in behavior, and that causes you to feel hyper alert as a young child and, and needing to do on your own what wasn't meant for a child to have to do. So there's a robbing of the, of the childhood, there's a robbing of the play, there's a robbing of the development, and could be physical abuse in the case of alcohol. And it's not like alcohol is not a big problem in America still. Or I was listening today to the statistics and more people died of drug, uh, co drug causes last year than ever in America. Uh, okay, so it's not like the world's version of life is causing people to do less drugs. Jesus has to be the answer. He's got to be the cornerstone, the true north, that compass. So you may have a predisposition due to weakness in your immune system that had nothing to do with your own bad choices. It just could be that you got used to something and nobody ever recognized it for you to show you that, no, that's not really the healthy ver version of love. You don't hit somebody when you love them. Trisha used to hit me when we first started dating, but she didn't mean it. She was just like, Pff. she'd do one of those in the car seat. I'm like, I'm bigger than you, you know? Like, you don't want me to do that. And it took her a while to break the habit. And it was, you know, it wasn't anything serious. Because if she wanted to, she could have took the keys, put them through her fingers. She showed me that move. And she could have just, you know, like got for her throat. So she was just like warning me, like, don't go there. I'm like, what do you think? I'm not meaning anything by this. I know you could never imagine her doing that. And it's not fair to talk about her when she's not here. Because this really is a serious subject, and I don't mean to make light of it. You just, you're, as a child, you want so badly to believe that your mother and father are good people because they're your mother and father and the only ones you get. So if they're doing things that are inconsistent, you'll make up a reason in your mind that maybe it was my fault or, or no, that's not how they really are because you, you have a really hard time coming to grips with the truth of, I don't have an out here. I'm nine years old. Where am I going to go? 
So you make excuses and justifications, and I don't want to run too far ahead here, but we, we really want to be careful that we can't go back and change anything. We don't want to blame them. We believe they did the best they could, right? You really need to get that one c cemented into your heart that hurt people hurt people. My father never read a book on parenting, never read a book on, on, on how to be a dad. And none of the people he knew ever read one. And they were pretty good fathers in their eyes. You know, they were good people. They were supporting their family, working, no alcohol problem, no infidelity in the marriage. Anger problem, yeah, he had an anger problem. I, you know, what did I know? I'm a kid. But I don't hold that against him because I believe he did the best he could with what he had. So we're not living in the past and recreating all those things. We're just looking for entry points where the devil might have got a hold. And then we're vulnerable then because of that entry point to somebody taking advantage of us. And you know the enemy is really good at that, isn't he? Because he's a liar. And he keeps lying to you. And where you stand strong on the word of God by firm foundation, you don't believe the lie. But when there's a crack in the foundation, he can sneak in with the lie. And then we become vulnerable to unhealthy relationships. Other people can often see it, but we have a hard time accepting their advice. So let's look at scripture. That's the most important thing to tie this all together, not my opinion. Befriend an outlaw and become an enemy to yourself. That's what we're thinking about, isn't it? That's a message Bible. Proverbs 29, 24. Befriend an outlaw and become an enemy to yourself. So we know that thou shalt not steal. Let's just use that as an example. So I look for an accountant who's going to help me cheat on my taxes. <laughs> like, should any Christian be doing this? Hello? Like, thou shalt not steal, right? So cheating on my taxes is not lined up with Scripture. I become an enemy to myself. That's not who I want to be. Yeah, but everybody does it. It doesn't matter. No, not everybody does it. Just because the world thinks it's okay doesn't mean you do it, right? What does the word say? If you're not sure, there's plenty of people here that can help you try to translate the Bible into everyday language. That's the beauty of being in community with each other. When in doubt, stick with the side of the law. All right. When the victims cry out, you'll be included in their curses if you're a coward to their cause in court. Leave it to Eugene Peterson to uh, put the pen to paper, right? So this is saying, if you stand by and you watch other people being taken advantage of and you don't do anything, you're a coward. You're a coward. You're not able to stand up at a time when they needed you to, to defend them. Be honest. Don't lie. Anybody ever seen anything happen on your job and you knew that this was going to go to HR and you were a witness of it, you could be a little reluctant to want to go say anything. Happened to me. There was a guy in our office when I was working at a different uh, company and he got really angry and he started yelling at his assistant. And he came out and, you know, he was really inappropriate. And I got up, right? That's what you do, just to get up and you walk over and you're going to stand in between them and you're like, hey, wait a minute, man, like calm down. Take it easy. She's crying, okay? You made your point. It wasn't my job to do that, but it was the right thing to do in that moment. And then it did go to HR, and I did say, yeah, it was inappropriate. I mean, I don't know the details of what happened, but I do know that's not supposed to happen in a workplace. If that was my sister, my wife, you know, no way. I don't care what she did. You don't, you don't have the right to treat her like that. So we don't want to be counted. Look at how it says it. When the victims cry out, you'll be included in their curses if you're a coward to their cause. This is very pertinent today. A lot of people work in situations where they're afraid to say anything. They're afraid to talk about what they really believe. So bad things might be going on, but not me. I can't afford to lose my job. That's exactly what the enemy wants. Get us to lie, because that's a violation of scripture. Anyway, the fear of human opinions disables us. Believe it? We're supposed to fear God or man? You all know the answer. But this fear of human opinion disables, and that's been a big part of the cancel culture, is just getting people to be afraid to, to speak the truth. And, and then you get a bunch of people that get used to lying for the cause. No thanks. Trusting in God protects you from fear of human opinions disabling you. Amen? And I said first century cancer culture. This is nothing new. There's been bullies around for a really long time. 
in uh, John chapter 12, verse 42, it says, Many leaders secretly believed in Jesus, but would not declare their faith, because the Pharisees continued their threats to expel all his followers from the synagogue. And here's why. They loved to please men more than they desired to glorify God. So again, want a reality check? Do you remember when Mario Marilla was here? And what was he saying, effectively, that if you're concerned about how America is doing socially, the culture wars, the crisis in the schools, you don't like the curriculum that's being taught to our children, whose fault is it? The church. We stood by and watched it and said, we're not supposed to be involved in those decisions. Sorry, wrong. And what a shame that it had to get this bad. But it is this bad now. We don't want to please men more than we desire to glorify God. It's going to be difficult at times to take a stand for what Jesus says. But you don't want to be hearing those victims. You know, you're part of the reason because you were a coward in the time when you had to take a stand. Now, I'm not saying to just act irrationally and just throw all wisdom and judgment and discernment to the wind. Look, remember Paul, when he, in the book of Acts, he goes into a new territory, and that woman who's possessed of a spirit, a divination, starts crying out and says, these men, anybody raise your hand? I can barely see you, but you can see me. You remember that, right? And didn't you wonder, like, when you first read it, like, I wonder why he told her to stop. What she was saying was true. Wouldn't that be good? Well, no, because if you're on a reconnaissance mission, think of Nehemiah, right, when he went down to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. He rode around the city at night. He didn't let anybody even know he was there. He was casing the joint <laughs> for God. So Paul is walking through, and now she is saying something that he doesn't want her to say, so he casts the demon out. So even though the demon made it look like it was good news, it wasn't time. It's discernment. You need to have high levels of discernment. So I'm not going to say when I stand before God, yeah, but I didn't want to hurt their feelings because we're supposed to be a mouthpiece for the truth and love, no doubt, not easy, but not to water down the word. And the, the American church has taken on this posture of not offending people, not talking about sin, changing scripture to say, well, if they feel that that's the way they want to live, same-sex attraction, we have to love them because we'd want to treat them the way we would want to be treated. Well, look, when I was doing drugs, I wanted to do drugs, but somebody loved me enough to tell me to stop. Mary Roselli, thank you. <laughs> you know this one, every kingdom divided against itself, Luke 11, 17. Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. And, and just to tie it into tonight's message of this ungodly soul tie and this codependent relationships, we are a house divided. We know something's going on here that's not healthy, but we don't feel the strength to end it. And it gets like a tangle, and we can't extract ourselves from that relationship. Yes, you can. We think we can't, but we can. But you have to identify it first and recognize it. And these are amazing principles that apply to so many things. Every kingdom divided itself is brought to desolation, and a house divided against a house falls. So if Satan is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand, right? You remember, they were accusing Jesus of casting out demons by the power of the devil. It makes no sense. Why would Satan cast out Satan? He wants to give you a double jeopardy, double dose, double for your trouble. You say, I cast out demons by Beelzebub. And if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? And you might wonder, what did he mean? I don't think their sons were casting demons out. <laughs> Honestly, like, Jesus is saying, well, I mean, you're seeing demons leave, at least, when I'm doing it. I don't know. That's a, a, an aside. I love this. If I cast out demons with the finger of God, maybe just like pinky finger, like, right? Like, he didn't need much. Boop, gone. Boop, leave. They weren't real long prayers. Come out. 
But if I cast out demons with the finger of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. When a strong man, fully armed, guards his own palace, his goods are in peace. And I'm purposely using this language so you can get a picture of what it's like to be in an unhealthy, codependent relationship. It's like you're locked behind a door and you can't get out because they're working witchcraft on you. They're, they're, they're leveraging a weakness in your life. And, and, and what the witchcraft does is... is make you believe that you can't change. Please don't ever say they will never change. Why? Because you're cutting God out of that formula. God can change anybody, anything. Nobody is helpless. I don't believe we have an unlimited amount of chances as we mature in the Lord. I do believe there is accountability that comes. So I don't want to make it sound like, you know, he, he did bring judgment upon Jerusalem because of sin, right? It's hard to read the Bible and not recognize that we're going to have a day of judgment. And, and he's merciful and long-suffering, the Bible tells us. So let's not live in this sloppy grace where, oh, well, he loves me. I can't lose my salvation. I'm, I'm getting by enough to get into heaven when I die. That is a counterfeit version of Christianity. You are here to be an ambassador for the kingdom. As the Father sent me, so I send you into the world for this purpose. The Son of God was manifest. You know it, right? To destroy the works of the devil. When a strong man, fully armed, protecting his place in your life, no, somebody else is coming. His goods are in peace. Verse 22, but when a stronger than he comes, who might that be? You're going to be right half the time and you just say, Jesus. When a stronger than he comes upon him and overcomes him, he takes from him all his armor in which he trusted and divides his spoils. The light turns on in your heart. You recognize it's a witchcraft kind of relationship. No more, devil. I'm taking back what the devil took from me. I'm getting my goods restored. Everything he stole, he convinced me of a lie about who I was, and he was wrong. It was a lie, and God revealed the truth to me. That's what deliverance is. It's removing those false lenses that the enemy got you to look through, often for no fault of your own. I'm going to keep saying that because the, the thing he wants to do is accuse us. And look, he's right that we sinned, right? It's, it's true that, that we were far from God, that sin separated us. But what's left out of his statement is that we've been forgiven and our record is expunged and somebody else paid the price. And now, even though we're not perfect, our hearts are after God. We, we're, we are in love him with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and then translate that into loving other people. Even if it means telling them hard things, th then they won't look back at us and say, why didn't you tell me? Luke 16, uh, sorry, yeah, 16, verse 13. Imagine you're a servant, and you have two masters giving you orders. Now, this would be the picture, right, of being in that unhealthy, codependent relationship. And your friends are saying, what do you see in this guy? Let's just say it's a woman and her friends are talking to her. Don't you realize he's abusive? You shouldn't let him talk to you like that. Oh, no, no, he really loves me. Anybody ever relate to this? Like, how come they can't see it? Because there's this thing going on. There's this witchcraft thing going on that's like a tick that's sucking the life out of them. And, and their eyes have to be open. And, and often that's part of what happens in deliverance is that people's eyes get open. They go back into an unhealthy relationship and they're not the same as when they left the house. And then if it's an angry boyfriend now calling up, say, what'd you do to my girlfriend? <laughs> and it's like, oh, she got free. She's not going to listen to your stinking thinking anymore. She's not going to put up with your abuse anymore. Where is this church? 3575 Valley Road, come on down, right? I mean, you can't live in fear of that one, right? Like, took the job, brother, you'll be a martyr. Hey, man, have a good life insurance policy. Because <laughs> that bully is going to turn his sights on you now. Like, no, bro, I mean, right Easter, I mean, I, I know there's many people on our team that would say this, but I just, you know, we don't ever talk about the specifics of what happens in the counseling room, but there have been men that have come in, like, really upset, like under duress, like didn't want to be there. This is stupid. I'm only here because she told me to come. And within like three sessions with Trisha, they're like, so sorry. I didn't mean that. <laughs> she has a way of just getting the truth out there quickly. She doesn't like to waste time. 
I'm so glad she got saved. Boy, I tell you. I mean, she, she, she took a terrible thing of the way she had to grow up fighting all the time, and now it's fighting with those same tools against the devil. Like, powerful. So, okay, you've got, uh, you're a servant and you have two masters. What are you going to do when they give you conflicting demands? You can't serve them both, so you'll either be, you'll hate the one first and love the second, or you'll faithfully serve the first and despise the second. One master is God, the other one is money, in this example. You can't serve them both. This is red letters. The Pharisees overheard this, and they started mocking Jesus because they really loved money. What does that tell you about the condition of the church? If we're going to call the Pharisees the representatives of the church, which they were to the Jewish community, there was corruption at the head of the church. That's a problem. You, you can't be a coward. You've got to call that out. And they loved money. What were they supposed to love? Thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's your first commandment. And then love your neighbor as yourself. They weren't. They really loved money. Jesus said to the Pharisees, you've made your choice. Your ambition is to look good in front of other people, not God. Can we repent of this, please? Can we re repent of being a little too quiet sometimes that things are being said and you just don't want to get into a tangle? You're allowed to stand your ground. I remember when my sons were uh, in school in eighth grade, uh, maybe, maybe sixth grade, and there was a Jewish uh, boy in, uh, in the cafeteria one of their classmates, and he wore a yarmulke. And they were making fun of him. Not my sons, they were watching, and they told me the story later. Uh, the other kids were making fun of him for this, and they asked him why he wasn't doing something. Maybe it was going out for Halloween, I forget now. And he said, um, because that's not part of my belief system. And they started laughing and mocking him, and, they, and he said, you can laugh all you want. You're not gonna change my mind. I know what I believe, right? Like sixth grade. That was drilled into that kid, and, and it's right in the Word of God. That's a high priority for parents. Talk to them about it all the time, in the morning, in the evening. They had that thing around their head to remind them, it's right here, it's in my mind, because the world's way is going to corrupt them. Your ambition, these are the leaders of the church, your ambition is to look good in front of other people, not God. But God sees through your heart, through to your hearts. And he values things differently from you. The goals you and your peers are reaching for, God detests. Why does that matter to us? Because we can easily allow a lukewarm mixture to come into our lives. We can sell out on, on the stance that we're taking as Christians. And it might work for a little while. It might look like you're avoiding some conflict. But it comes back to haunt us later. It's going to be my position, especially in relationships. More language like this, Galatians 1, Paul says, do you think I care about the approval of men or about the approval of God? What do you think? Louder, please. God, yeah, the approval of God. Do you think I'm on a mission to please people? Thank you. If I'm still spinning my wheels trying to please men, then there's no way I can be a servant of the anointed one, the liberating king. And, you know, Paul said that in another portion of Scripture. Everything I used to think was important, following all those rules and living up to it, I, I excelled in it, but it didn't get me the salvation that I needed. It was surrendering all that to Jesus. Doesn't mean he doesn't follow the rules. He's just not doing it out of fear now. He's doing it out of love. Acts 4, you, you know this, so I'll go through it quickly, but really important, especially as we think about who the people were that were involved. In, in Acts chapter 3, right before this, Peter and John were arrested for healing the paralytic man. Remember, everybody knew, and, and the man was jumping up and down. It was creating a, a, what, a ruckus, you might say. And the leaders were surprised and confused because they looked at Peter and John and they realized they were typical peasants, uneducated, utterly ordinary fellows with extraordinary confidence. That's not what they were used to seeing. The leaders recognized them as companions of Jesus. Then they turned their attention to the third man standing beside them, recently lame, now standing tall and healthy. Woo! When somebody gets delivered, it's the same body, but it's a different person. It's a different spirit. Some 
they know you. The people that know you say, what happened to you? It's like you're a different person. They say, no, I'm, I'm just not carrying all that baggage I used to have. This is the real me that everybody's been waiting to see all along. I just had locked down under all that junk of the devil. But I got free. How much did that cost you? Nothing. Prayer. Oh, sounds like a good deal to me. Well, it didn't cost us anything, but it cost him everything. So don't ever diminish what he did for us. So these guys are like, you know what cognitive dissonance is? It's a, it's a phrase that they throw around a lot today. It's when a truth appears in front of you that just so rattles you, it's so opposite of what you think could, could be the truth, that you come up with these crazy ways of, of explaining something because you just can't admit that you might have been wrong about that thing. And, and one, of the, one of the authors that I admire said, reality is what you run into when you're wrong. That's cognitive dissonance, right? Like, you don't know how to handle what's going on. And that's what was happening to these uh, Pharisees and, and the elders. Like, they, were, they saw these uneducated men. And in their algorithm, you had to be highly educated in order for God to use you. They were not highly educated. This guy's healed. They had walked past that guy at the temple for years. Never even tried to get him healed because they were trying to please men. I could really go on a lot of rabbit trails right now. But I'll just say this. When we first came out here, you know, I'm, I'm in the financial business, so I know that, that there's a lot of money out here. And, and well-meaning people at our church, at, at the beginning when we were just meeting at the firehouse, somebody would visit that they would know, and they'd say, oh, wow, we should hope that they come here because if they tithe, we would have more money in, in the church. Now, I know that they were well-meaning, Right? But what happens in the heart of the pastor if the pastor's thinking that way? It's like all of a sudden, if I see the person who, who they told me has a lot of money doing something wrong, am, am I going to hesitate to correct them? How could God bless that? He couldn't. He couldn't bless that. People can't buy their way into favor with God. And I married Trish. That would never fly. Okay? The money isn't what matters. It's the anointing. That's what we need. We all need the anointing. And people with money without an anointing could be really dangerous. But when they get both, boy, look out, devil. So what could they say in response to this? Arrest them. What did they do wrong? They got a man healed. How are they, how are they justifying arresting him? The leaders brought the prisoners back in and prohibited them from doing any more speaking or teaching in the name of Jesus. Don't you be healing anybody else out there. We want them sick. We want the hospitals full. I mean, really, like if this isn't cognitive dissonance, what? Peter and John listened and said, ah, you're the judges here, so we'll leave it up to you to judge whether it's right in the sight of God to obey your commands or God's. These are the peasant guys that are telling them what they should have been telling Peter and John. But one thing I know we can tell you, we may look like peasants, but we can't possibly restrain ourselves from speaking about what we have seen and heard with our own eyes and ears. Silver and gold have I not, but what I do have, I give to you. Stand up in the name of Jesus. So upon their release, they went right to their friends and told their story, including the warning from the council, and the whole community responded with this prayer to God. And I'm just going to tell you, this is a very present, helpful prayer right now in 2022. Okay, the world's kind of pulling apart at the seams in a way that I've never experienced or witnessed. Um, so you really do need that, you need that compass to be on the true north, not to get thrown off by this stuff. And he says, now, Lord, take note of their intimidations intended to silence us. That's what the devil's been trying to do to the church forever, right? So no, sorry, no bully spirit going to win. Grant us, your servants, the courageous confidence. Can you say that with me? Courageous confidence. What a good combination of words that we need to go ahead and proclaim your message while you reach your hand to heal people, enabling us to perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Do you remember Luke? I'm sorry, James? I'm thinking of another guy that looks like James. 
when he was up here Sunday? Did your toes start to curl a little when he started singing Amazing Grace? <laughs> oh, I hope he could sing. But he could sing. It was really good. It was anointed because he was singing from the heart that, man, I was dead six months ago. I could have been a dead man. Why would he love me so much to save my life? You can't put a price on that. That's an encounter, a real encounter with a living God that completely changes the direction of somebody's life. And, you know, whether you see it a lot or not, is it the issue? The issue is opening the door and, and creating an atmosphere where it can happen. And that's what we're going to keep on doing. We're going to keep opening up the door. We're going to worship God. We're going to speak the word. And we're going to believe that he wants to follow us with signs and wonders. That's what he said he would do. And you can't say, well, what if it doesn't work? Or how am I going to look in the eyes? People are going to think I'm in what they, they say. You're giving people false hope. Look, they can think whatever they want. I know what he did in my life. You guys know what he did in your life. So that's good enough for me. Grant us the courageous confidence that we need to go ahead and proclaim your message while you reach out your hand to heal people, enabling us to perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. The Holy Spirit changes everyone and everything. Think of Peter. When Jesus was captured, Peter cowered in fear that he might be identified as a man who loved Jesus. Now, in the book of Acts, he's preaching, healing, and pointing his finger in the face of the Jewish officials. With a boldness that's not his own, he blames them for the death of Jesus and does not cower at their show of violence. There was 5,000 people saved that day from these two peasants, right? Like little old me, Randy Clark will say. God will use anybody who's willing to be used, right? Is there fear coming in? Sure, of course, the enemy's gonna try to intimidate you. He's a liar. So fear is false evidence appearing real. He's always gonna try to lie to you. It's what he does, he's the father of lies. And then I just wanted to remind you of this too. You can see in the dark, this is the psalmist talking to God. You can see in the dark, for it's not dark to your eyes. You shaped me inside and out. You knitted me together in my mother's womb long before I took my first breath. Explore me, O oh God, and know the real me. Dig deeply and discover who I am. Put me to the test and watch how I handle the strain. That's a pretty courageous prayer, isn't it? Is everybody willing to say this prayer? Because we should say it right now. Because, listen, if there's an unhealthy relationship in your life in this codependent way, you're being held back from the full flourishing that God wants you to have. So it might be difficult to break it off. It's hard to change. I get it. It's hard. You have a lot of muscle memory from doing the wrong things for so long. But nothing's impossible for God. And look, that other person could get saved through this. Or maybe they're calling themselves a Christian now, but if they really were, they wouldn't be operating in witchcraft and trying to control you in an unhealthy way, maybe they don't even realize it, but something has to break because you shouldn't be living below the level that God wants you to live at, right? So you see in the dark. It's not dark to your eyes. You shaped me inside and out. You knitted me together in my mother's womb long before I took my first breath. Explore me, O oh God. Know the real me. Dig deeply and discover who I am. Put me to the test. That takes courage. Put me to the test and watch how I handle the strain. Examine me to see if there's an evil bone in me and guide me down your path forever. That's it. That's the deliverance process right there. This is not once and done. Okay? It's layers that is not meant to be like, oh, my God, I'm going to be in a lifetime of counseling. No. It's more looked at we're going to be in a lifetime of dying to the old flesh and allowing him to resurrect the new man while we're here which we'll have it fully when we get to the other side, but we can have it now if we allow him to work this process in us, death, burial, and resurrection. And then I'm going to get to just a little bit more of the specifics, and then we'll wind it down. Idolatry in any form is a sin. So if I'm in a codependent relationship, and I'm not holding this person accountable because they're working something on me, it's a form of idolatry in this relationship. I might have a wrong picture of God's true version of love. Maybe an example, 
Uh, my family, I've mentioned it before, is um, we're, we're of Italian descent. My family's in the garbage business. There was a very dark side of the Teamsters Union that forced us to have to, forced them, not me, to have to do things that they didn't want to do. But my cousins were threatened. You know, it was just a whole bunch of really dark stuff. So, what do they do? Like, they, they, they would have lost everything, so they were kind of forced to do things that they didn't want to do. And if you're in that culture and they say you have to do something, it could become a form of idolatry. Loyalty to the family is less important than loyalty to this family, the, the Word of God. And, and it's your family, right? Now, we, we forget that the early Christians one of the reasons they called each other brother and sister is because when they became Christians, their family didn't want anything to do with them anymore. So they had to have a strong conviction because in those days, if you didn't have your family, you didn't have much. They all worked together in community and they needed each other. So for you to take a stand and say, no, sorry, I'm not doing that, then your family say, all right, well then you want to do that? Then we have nothing to do with you anymore. You're on your own. No, I'm not on my own. I got a bunch of brothers and sisters. And I got a father who's willing to take care of me. And I wouldn't be alive without him, so I know he's got me. Because he brought me this far. And he ain't done with me yet. Amen. It's a sin to be in idolatry, even when that which we idolize seems good and necessary for our lives. God designed our spirits to seek and to give love for his glory. All right, you with me? In, in the pure form, we were created in the garden to seek love, right? He wanted fellowship with people, with, with humanity. He wanted, uh, 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 I heard it put this way, he wanted to see what it would be like to have the nature of the universe, which cannot be limited, to live inside a limited, limited body. Isn't that a cool way to look at it? That's us, until sin came in. And now all of a sudden, it's, it's that nature, but it's been tainted by sin, and we've been separated. He designed our spirits to seek and to give, out, give love for his glory, but when we worship our own chosen idolatrous forms of love, then we serve ourselves instead of God and others. Be subject to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now, if you know this chapter, this is about marriage, right, which is awesome, convicting. Husbands, love your wives the way Christ loved the church. Wives, submit to your husbands, right? So wives, you say, love me the way Christ loved the church, and I'll submit to you. Just kidding. <laughs> I think the men do have a tougher side of the equation. This is really good. Try to get this. I know it's running a little long here, but try to get this one. This is another one of the Sanford's um, verses that they talked about a lot because... Just because we're not aware that something's wrong doesn't mean there isn't an area that we can improve on. That's a summary, right? Although I'm not aware of any flaw that might exclude me from this divine service, serving God, that's not the reason I stand acquitted. The only supreme judge, our Lord, will examine me in the proper time. So we look in the mirror every day and we say, Lord, reveal things that don't belong in here, and I will do my best to, to, to work with you to, to flush this thing from my system. And, and I'm willing to do that because I know the outcome is going to be so much better. So resist that temptation to act as a judge before all the evidence is in. When the Lord comes, he'll draw our buried motives, our thoughts and our deeds, what we don't know or admit to ourselves. He'll draw those things out of the dark shadows of our hearts and into his light. Now, could that happen tonight? Yes. It doesn't just mean when the Lord comes at the second return. It's when the Lord comes in the room with you in that moment and boom the light goes on or you get a physical healing during worship and nobody laid hands on you that sounds like a pretty good deal the, the no step program never mind the one step or the 12 step god describes the two ways that relationships work to the degree of our proximity to the cross all right this is so sanford right here right to the, to the ability that we're willing to bring it all to him and say, this might have got me here, Lord, but it's not what you want me to use to get me forward. So even though I've learned how to use this thing, I'm, I'm leaving it at the cross and saying, I trust you to give me a better way. 
to go forward. The degree, that's what they mean, to the proximity of the cross, manifest, manifesting the death of Christ in our current lives right now, we can be subject to one another, that's the verse we just read, in ways that are life-giving to other people. And I would say, personally, I've come to see that as integration with God. And in psychology, they use that term, integrated, for people that, and I'm, I'm not going to practice without a license here, but if you saw the movie Sybil, right? She was somebody who suffered from multiple personality disorder. And, and they say there's an integration process that happens when the alternates get integrated into the main personality. That's a healing process, okay? And maybe you don't believe that happens or not, but in the context here, it's, any relationships, it doesn't, again, we're not wrestling against the person. It's not the flesh and blood person. It's, it's the toxic effect that the relationship is having on you, and it has to be severed. It has to be broken. It's a tick. It's sucking the life out of you. And you need to be around people who are enriching you, who fill you, uh, who, who raise the bar of what you can expect to be a Christian can't be subject to one another in ways that are life-giving to others unless we are manifesting that regular amount of death. And then the inverse is also true. To the degree that we distance ourselves from the cross, those areas that are not fully submitted to God, we will be subject to the harmful things in each other's flesh. And that scary word is disintegration, right? We're used to thinking of something disintegrating from a nuclear bomb. But disintegration means just we're, we're further away from God than we need to be. So one way or the other, you're either producing good fruit or bad fruit. There's no no fruit zone. Thanks, Rich. I woke him up back there. No, no, no. He's awake. I love him. When love becomes as God designed it to be, we identify love properly. But it's through affection and wise discipline and affirmation Sacrificial love is the example that we want. When we don't receive God's designed love, we identify it as whatever we get from the primary people in our lives, and that could include abuse, criticism, battering, neglect, substitution of things in place of the time and attention and the affection that we need. So I'm just going to end on a funnier note just because this is not the easiest subject, right? Anybody know this show, Everybody Loves Raymond? They were brilliant. Whoever the writers were must have had like five degrees in psychology. Who's the biggest psycho on the show? That's a hard thing, right? I would vote for Marie, the mother-in-law, Raymond's mother. There's a codependent relationship between her and her two sons, right? And that's not healthy. This is not the biblical example. And the lady just plays it to the T, doesn't she? And who's the big victim is the wife, Deborah. Right? Because she's stuck. They live right across the street. I mean, one of the shows, a guy came over to talk about doing the wills. And, and Ray said, you know, if, what happens when you do your will? If, if you both die in a plane crash, who's going to be the one to take care of your kids? And Raymond innocently says, well, my parents could be the ones. And Deborah looks at him like, no. Nah. And they invite a couple of friends. They realize they have to name somebody in the will. So they invite two friends over, and they go through this long party, and they give them dinner, and they get to the point in the conversation, and they say, hey, you know, we're doing our wills, and the, the attorney asks us if we knew anybody who would be willing to take our children. You know, the, it's a million to one that it would ever happen, but, but we thought of you guys. Would you be willing to do that? And they, the, the guy went, oh, my God, Ram, that's amazing that you would put that much trust and respect in you? And he looks at his wife like, aren't you like blown away by this? And then the guy looks at Raymond and he goes, not in a million years. Your family are psychos, <laughs> right? <laughs> so like, that's part of what's funny, but it's not so funny if you're in it, if you're Deborah. So Marie comes over, this is just one conversation. I'm probably gonna, not gonna do it the same justice is showing it, but she said, all right, Deb, we've had our share of arguments and tiffs, but it's because you don't understand me. I'm just misunderstood. <laughs> I'm not interested in a relationship of artificial pleasantries and phony smiles. That's a total lie. She does this all the time. I'm always honest with you, aren't I? No. 
But if I see you desperately need help with something, like cooking, <laughs> cleaning, the children, your hair, I just care so much that I have to say something because I want to help. I forgive you for, t for today. I'm always here to help. There's not one true statement on the whole thing there. It's so twisted, but it wouldn't be funny if it wasn't true, <laughs> right? It's because I love you that I have a vice grip around your life. No. And then this, uh, I'll end here with this one uh, as far as these go. So Marie's talking to Deborah, and the backstory is that Raymond just disrespected Marie, and Marie is now the victim talking to Deborah. Do you ever doubt your worth as a mother? And Deborah says, yes, of course. Imagine your little son, Michael, who lights up whatever you get near him. And then imagine him at 14 years old and he doesn't even talk to you anymore. One night you make him his favorite dinner and you try to give him a kiss goodnight and he goes up the stairs with a great huff, or a grunt, sorry. And then you come across his journal and it says, I hate my mother. <laughs> I wouldn't wish that on you, Deborah. <laughs> And Deborah goes, Raymond, apologize to your mother. <laughs> so instead of just saying, my feelings are hurt by the way Raymond treated me, she's got to play this whole dilemma of drama. And, and, and Deborah's like so used to this because it's such a manipulation tool. Ray, apologize to your mother. She can't just ask you. She's got to go through 10 chapters. That's not healthy. Come on, raise your right hand. I will not let this happen to me. <laughs> so, you don't love your mother. You don't call me anymore. It's okay. You'll miss me when I'm dead. People do this all the time. It's not Jesus. I got to love him more than I need other people to need me. All right. I'm going to wind it down. Uh, think of it this way. There's life-giving love. They call that in the Sanford's material. That's regenerative love. And then there's unregenerate love that never fills you, that never is satisfied. You always need another compliment. You're always looking for somebody to pat you on the back. You're so insecure about who you are. You don't know your identity. So your only identity is to get other people to give you praise and applause. That is not Jesus. That's not healthy. We've got to break that. It can transform the way we respond to other people. When we start getting healthy and we realize that he loves me, and yes, it's important to think about what other people think about you, but your life and your identity and your worth is not based on what other people think. It's based on what God thinks. And you know what? When you try to change, you're not going to be an expert the day you start trying to change. It's going to feel a little awkward to create those new muscles and to try things differently, and, and it's going to feel awkward. And the people around you have to love you through that to make to help you with that and until that unregenerate part the life draining the tick dies we can't be vulnerable and be free to be ourselves we live in a world of tension always trying to anticipate demands and potential criticisms and I'm just going to put in another word for our friends if you came down to Trenton or you came to Philly you saw John and Cheryl Price and and that whole tribe of people in the Northeast here that we meet and and go and do ministry with all around here. The prophetic people have gotten this part down. They're very comfortable in their skin. They're willing to live in a risky place where they say something and they might be wrong. They're getting an impression from God and it's not going to always be right. But they're going to trust God enough and it's been right enough that they're pressing in for their gift, right? They put a demand on the anointing of God and because of that courage, they give people words, and I can tell you personally, at least three different times, once from Chuck Pierce and twice from Cindy Jacobs, they gave me words, and then I was confronted with a situation, and it wasn't the only thing. There were other reasons, but because I knew there was a word behind it, I stepped through that open door the Lord gave me, and it changed my life for the better. So, you know, take it for what it's worth, but I'm saying, like, John Price is not somebody who cares a lot about what other people think about him. He's very comfortable in his own skin. Cheryl, same thing. They love you enough to tell you what they feel like God is telling them. If they're wrong, they'll admit it. But they're not spending a lot of time wondering about how it's coming across. Because they know how to hear God and they tell you. And I guess the older you get, you know, the less time you want to waste on being Marie. And just, just get to the point. 
You don't have to talk about this whole story. My feelings are hurt. My son walked away. And, you know, maybe Deborah would say, well, if you weren't such a psycho, look in the mirror. <laughs> now, look, again, not making light of it, in some severe cases of abuse and neglect, unregenerate love can take shape in ways that are clearly not love. Sexually abused individuals sometimes identify inappropriate touch as love when that is the only physical touch they received as a child from their parents. Escaping the grip, this is the last slide, of this idolatry starts with recognizing where we have bowed to these idols, okay? So can you just reflect on that for a minute right now in your own life? And I'm not telling you that everybody has this going on, but you need to know about it because with the identity crisis in America right now and really the whole world, but especially here, more and more people are falling victim of being tricked into believing there's somebody that they're not. And they need the church to come alongside in a healthy way, not expecting anything in return, and just saying, this is what I see the Lord has for you for your life. And I'm going to speak into that, and I'm going I'm to work with you to help you grow into who God wants you to be, not who you think people need you to be. And what better tactic of the enemy would be to try to get little children to question whether they're a boy or a girl. How can you confuse somebody more about their identity than that? That's number one thing that nobody would have ever thought would ever be in question, that there's no biological difference between a man and a woman. It's just the most bizarre idea that somebody would try to convince you of that, but why not shoot for the moon? And then if you come down a little below that, it's still completely crazy. It's not who you are. It's not your identity. We have to first take it in Christ, but then integrate our lives into the church. Sorry, of course I'm going to say that. I'm a pastor, but I'm not just saying it because of that. This is what the gates of hell will not prevail against. His church, being around other people, coming together, praying, getting hands laid on you. Coming with a question. Coming when you're having a hard time. I need somebody to pray with me right now. How would you handle this? And then going to the food pantry and bagging some food and going and delivering something and, and getting out of your normal routine and being reminded, oh my God, there's 15 people waiting in line for this food. I didn't have to wait online for food today, right? It's like a reset. You're reminding yourself there's a lot of hurting people out there. Maybe I should stop complaining as much as I'm complaining because maybe it's not as bad as I thought. It's this engagement with a culture that's life-giving. Amen? You're all here, so I'm kind of preaching to the choir. Um, so let's stand, okay? I just want to pray, and we'll have prayer here at the altar. If you feel like the Lord might have highlighted something or identified something in you tonight, um, you know, we really want to remind you that we're not talking about wrestling against flesh and blood. It's not the person who's the enemy it's just that the enemy might be using that person to take advantage of you. And, and the Lord will show you the way to escape the grip of that thing. Ideally, in a way that they recognize it too, and if they're not saved, that they get saved. Could be a family member, right? Could be somebody that you have to deal with at family events or a million versions of this. But manipulation is not God, all right? He, he's the spirit of truth. And we don't want to be afraid of just telling the truth and being, and being honest with one another. Amen? So let's, let's confess and repent uh, if, there's, if there's that issue in our lives. Lord, I'm sorry. You don't have to repeat after me, but this is just how I would say it. I'm sorry if I have misidentified my priority here and worried too much about what other people are thinking about me. I'm sorry if I've allowed myself to be manipulated by somebody who I now see is just taking advantage of me. And I forgive myself for falling into that trap. And you might have to say, I forgive you, Lord, for whatever reason that you might think that he should have showed it to you or whatever. Why did you let that happen to me? And right, we prayed from Psalm 139, show me my heart when I'm under stress, when I'm in strain, reveal what's inside of me. So if that's happening for you, it's, it's not hard. He wants to hear you. Just say, I repent of that. I repent of, of a misplaced loyalty, of thinking this person's opinion is more important than your opinion of me. And help me see clearly 
what you really think about me, not what the devil tells me you think about me, not what my father said about me or other people in my life that hurt me, but what you think of me, because that's my real identity as a son and daughter of the living God who's my dad, not the angry judge who wants to punish me, but a loving father who wants to reveal his heart to me. I just thank you, Lord, for the folks that are here that are open to this prayer. And I pray that revelation that you would open up our eyes. I hope there's no unhealthy relationships or codependent relationships. But even if there's not in their lives, if there's somebody in their lives and they see this, give them the ability to speak the truth in love. Not as their judge, not as judge and jury, but just with making them aware that there might be something unhealthy going on. And Lord, I thank you that it's your desire for us to flourish. And can you say that? Thank you, God, that you desire for my life to flourish in every way. I'm willing to be your student as you teach me how to get there. In Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen.